Okay, um, welcome to the new lecture, this new lecture on in the introduction to oxygen uptake. So, in this lecture, we are going to uh, really cover two um, large topics. Um, we're going to start looking at basic muscle energetics, and then we're going to look at oxygen uptake during exercise. And these really are the kind of fundamentals to this whole module. Um, it might not seem like it from the outset, but as you go through and as we sort of work through these different topics, what you're going to realise is that a lot of what we do in exercise physiology in general can be boiled down um, to these two things. So what we're going to do first off is I'm going to throw it over to you straight away. And as I said in sort of previous sessions, it's really important that you do these tasks and don't just skip over them. Um, I will keep reiterating this point without apology. You need to get in the habit of committing to an answer to a question and then being prepared to be right or wrong and allowing that to either confirm or disprove what your current theory or understanding of something is. It's the best and simplest way to learn. If you just skip over and wait for the answer, you're less likely to retain the information. So the task is straight up. Um, try and take two or three minutes. Why is oxygen important for life? And in particular, why is it important for exercise? So the whole module pretty much is based around oxygen uptake. And so it's going to be important to really kind of get a grasp on what your current level of general understanding of its importance is. So have three minutes if you stop the video now. Okay, so the answers that I normally get to this question are quite varied and they can kind of be surface level or often you get really deep answers as well. So we're going to go through kind of the process that normally happens if this was if this was done live. So when I ask what's it important, how's it important for life or exercise, people will say, well, you need oxygen to live. So it's absolutely true. That's like right across the board, you need oxygen to live. So then I ask the question, well, why do you need it to live? And then someone will say, because, you know, you need, your body needs it. OK, why? Why does your body need it? And then bit by bit, we work down and often we'll get to, well, your cells need oxygen. And again, why? Um, oxygen is required for um, ATP resynthesis is kind of where we get to or is required for the reproduction of ATP. Which was at that point, like half of the class are kind of like, oh, kind of remember something about that at some point, but not really. A quarter of the class are kind of quite happy with it, and another quarter might never have really even heard about it or thought about it in any depth whatsoever. Um, so that's usually the process. And I say, well, what about exercise? Why is it particularly important for exercise? And again, you get a variety of answers because, you know, when you run faster, you need more oxygen. Or if you want to do a marathon, you need to take lots of oxygen. And again, we boil it down. Why, 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 why? And it comes back to exactly the same point. So we need uh, oxygen uh, for exercise in particular because we have a greater requirement for that ATP resynthesis, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So that's what it all boils down to. So often when you think about oxygen, sometimes people think about the lungs or you might even think about the heart. And those things are all really, really important. They're required, but they're really mechanisms of transporting oxygen. The reason you actually need oxygen is because you need it in the cells and you need it for that ATP resynthesis, which is going to allow you to sort of produce energy. OK, so this is my sort of tin pot theory about um, the whole of exercise physiology. So obviously exercise physiology is incredibly complex, but it's often you can get lost in the complexity. Um, and so what I tried to do here is really boil it down to its absolute sim most simplest sort of components. So if you think about it, the only thing that separates exercise physiology from physiology is that it revolves movement, revolves around movement. So we need the muscles to do that. So we're going to focus this kind of this idea on the muscles because that's going to allow us to move. So um, what we have is, you know, the muscles have these these components, if you like, these actin and myosin filaments that are able to move across one another, um, which allow us subsequently to move. So it has to have some movement element. Otherwise, it's not exercise physiology. It's just physiology. 
And so what we know is that in order for these filaments to move across one another and allow us to move, it needs a stimulus. So I tell you what, let me get a pointer. So it needs a stimulus. So it needs this kind of electrical stimulus. It tells the muscles to contract. So, you know, the muscles um, that we use to move don't just contract on their own. They need this stimulus need to be told this is when we want to contract. So if you think about what we've got so far, you know, like muscle physiology here is a lot of the stuff you might think about that when you're thinking about strength because you're looking to try and build these muscles. You could think about them from an endurance perspective because you might be trying to change the way that those muscles kind of use energy, which we're going to get into at the moment. At the top here, the electrical stimulus stuff, where you learn about that sometimes in second and third year when you're talking about um, um, electro um electrical impulses that sort of allow the muscles to contract and you can kind of measure that using the EMG. Um, the stuff that we're going to talk about, the angle that we take for this module is really looking at this energy side of things. So if you want the muscles to contract, they need to be told to contract, but then they also need the energy to allow that contraction to occur. So how do they get that, you know, that um, energy to allow the um, muscles to contract? Well, they get it through this thing called ATP hydrolysis or ATP breakdown. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. And what happens to it is it gets broken down through this process called ATP hydrolysis and gets turned into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and inorganic phosphate. So it's basically just one of the phosphate molecules in this ATP gets broken off. So then you have diphosphate and then the inorganic phosphate. And that process of breaking it down sort of liberates energy that can be harnessed to allow well all sorts of mechanisms within the body but we're particularly interested in muscle contraction so this breakdown of atp provides the energy that allows muscle contraction to occur so that's and then the question is well okay you know if we use lots of this atp we now have adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate well how do we get that atp back again so that we can continue to produce if you like energy and that process is called ATP resynthesis so ATP resynthesis is simply the building back up of ATP by combining ADP and inorganic phosphate again and so you get this cycling of these molecules around and around and around and that is what allows us to be able to move now for ATP resynthesis um, the way that we need it, we have to put energy back into the system to bind these molecules together again. And we do that through the combustion of food, often with oxygen. So think about this. When we talk about how the lungs work, how the cardiovascular system works, you know, when we think about veins and arteries and all of this sort of stuff, all these are doing are providing oxygen and to some extent food to the muscles to allow this to reoccur, this sort of um, resynthesis of ATP, to provide the energy to allow muscle contraction and so long as there's an electrical stimulus. So it's actually quite a small part of the process, but obviously it's crucial. And then we're not going to talk about it too much on this module, but obviously we have the food component as well. So lots of you are on the nutrition course. All the stuff that you learn to do with nutrition, to do with exercise, or the vast majority of it, is all about manipulating this small part of it here. How can you make sure that food is where it needs to be to be combusted with oxygen so that you can resynthesize ATP for muscle contraction? So that's kind of a, a simple way of thinking. And, and I would advise you that when you're going through the whole of your course, you kind of come back to this really simple slide and just think about what you're, how what you're learning fits into this simple model. Because as I say, if you're thinking about doing strength stuff, well, you're going to be thinking about how maybe, you know, these actin and myosin filaments change to build muscle. Or you might be thinking about like this system of ATP breakdown and how you can improve that or a simpler way of um, altering the way that ATP is resynthesized so you can kind of have high levels of ATP for, you know, powerful contractions. If you're doing lots of stuff to the nutrition, well, you know, if you're giving somebody carbohydrates, well, you know, is that, are those carbohydrates getting to the muscle where they're needed, where they can combine with oxygen to resynthesize this ATP? It all fits into this really, really simple system. 
Now, and what we're going to do from the perspective of this module is what we're really interested in is oxygen. So we're going to focus on this side of things. And then when we start thinking about lung disease and heart disease, we start to think about, well, if your heart doesn't work properly and therefore you can no longer deliver as much oxygen to the muscles to resynthesize this ATP, well, then how, that, how is that going to affect somebody's ability to exercise? And if we look at it the other way, we could say, well, if someone's got an inability to exercise to a sort of chronic level, well, then maybe that tells us that somewhere within this system it's not working properly. Now, this can be in certain diseases because they're not able to stimulate the muscles to contract. Um, so if you've got a neuromuscular disease, so it can be because of that. It could be because they've got a issue with delivering food. So I work with a condition called glycogen storage disease. They're unable to break down glycogen, so it influences their ability to deliver food to resynthesize ATP, and therefore they have exercise intolerance. But a lot of diseases that we're com uh, that are common to us or we're familiar with, things like lung disease, COPD, um, or heart disease, is often due to an inability to deliver this oxygen to the muscle to allow it to combust with this food, to resynthesize this ATP, to allow it to be broken down, to produce energy, to allow muscle contraction. Okay, so that's a really long slide, but it's an important one. Right, now back over to you guys. So um, the next question is, well, if we're happy that we need to we need ATP to perform work. So it's crucial. If we've not got that ATP, we can't do the work that we need to do. In an ideal world, we'd be able to have that ATP readily available for as much muscle contraction as we would want. So you can kind of imagine if we had all the ATP ready there near the muscles, we would be able to run as fast as we'd like for as long as we'd like. If it never ran out um, and it was always there ready to be you know broken down to sort of liberate that energy we could run as fast as we wanted for as long as we want but that's not what happens but what i want you to do is do a sort of thought experiment and think well if i wanted a lot of atp near the um, muscle fibers ready to allow it to contract as, you know as fast and as, as hard as it would like how would you achieve that so what is the ideal way to have a limitless supply of ATP at the muscle. So if you pause the video now, I have two minutes to answer. Okay, so when I ask the question to this, um, it sometimes throws people um, because what I'm after interested in is is not the actual answer, not you know what actually happens, but whether you can kind of think through the process of how you could maybe achieve it um, in another world, if you like. So um, one of the ways you could do it, and often students get this, is, well, if you wanted lots of ATP available at the mus at muscle, what you could do is you could store lots and lots of ATP in and around the muscle. So almost like if you had a limited storage of ATP, then you wouldn't need to worry about anything else because it would just be there so that you could you know, do really high-intensity work um, for a long period of time. So, and it's absolutely true, that would be true. However, that's not the case. We don't have large stores of ATP. So even though that would be a solution, it's not actually a solution. ATP stores uh, throughout the body and within the muscle are actually quite low. And one of the reasons why this might be is because ATP is actually quite a heavy molecule. And so I've got sort of a simple um, calculation to illustrate why having really high stores of ATP probably doesn't occur. We probably selected against it over sort of millennia of, um, of adaptation. So if you wanted to run a 30 miles so or half marathon at sort of a reasonable rate, uh, you burn about 100 kcals of energy per mile. So your overall marathon is going to um, mean that you need to, cons you need to produce um, 1,300 kcals of energy, or use 1,300 um, 1, kcals of energy. Now, a mole of ATP yields 7.3 kcals. So, if we to work out how many moles of ATP we need, we can take that 1,300 kcals, divide it by the 7.3 kcals and, um, that, are, that are produced by uh, from one mole of ATP. And that tells us that in order to run a half marathon, we need about 178 moles of ATP. 
Now, one mole of ATP weighs 0.5 kilograms. So, like I say, it's a heavy molecule. And so, in order to run that marathon, we take the 178 moles that we would need to run the marathon. Each one of those moles weighs 0.5 kilograms. So, the energy that's used in running a half marathon, if we were to store it in the form of ATP, it would weigh 89 kilograms. So, you can see that that just wouldn't be functionally possible. So what like I said, what's probably happened over years is that, you know, it was not selectively advantageous to have high levels of ATP. And so we don't store them because we can't carry around an extra, you know, 100 kilograms of ATP just to be able to sort of run a, 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 um, a reasonable distance. So that would be a solution, but it's not the solution. So we have low stores of ATP and that's important. So the next perfect solution would be, well, actually, and students usually get this right, is, well, what if we were able to turn over that ATP, resynthesize that ATP, but there was no limitations to it? So if we could turn over that ATP much faster than what we could use it, then we'd always have a ready supply of ATP ready for, um, for sort of energy and, and muscle contraction. Now, um, basically, I've put a figure on here, which just looks at a thing called phosphocreatine. Um, and essentially, phosphocreatine kind of represents the balance between the rate of ATP use, so breakdown, hydrolysis, and the rate of ATP synthesis. And so if the number goes down, it kind of indicates that you're using more ATP than you're able to resynthesize. If it goes up, then conversely, you're resynthesizing more ATP than what you're utilizing, which doesn't tend to occur. And what we can see from this figure, this is just somebody starting to do high intensity exercise at about four minutes. So when they start this high block of exercise, what we can see is that phosphocreatine levels decrease. And then once they stop exercise, it replenishes back to its sort of baseline level. And all this really shows us is that we aren't able to resynthesize ATP at the same rate that we're able to use it. So we're able to utilize the ATP much quicker than we're able to resynthesize. So even though it would be a perfect solution to be able to you know, keep turning over that ATP um, at an unlimited rate, we're not able to do that either. Okay, so that's important. So the first point is we have low stores of ATP. The second point is we can't recycle that ATP as quick as we can use it. So then this is the actual solution. This is what a lot of you students come back to because you're kind of quite familiar with it. So the actual solution is um, this sort of three pronged attack of resynthesizing ATP. So we have these three systems. We have the ATP PCR system. We have the anaerobic glycolysis system and we have oxidative phosphorylation. And so the first two, the ATP PCR system and anaerobic glycolysis, are both anaerobic systems. So they don't use any oxygen in order to resynthesize the ATP. Whereas oxidative phosphorylation, as is sort of indicative in the name, does use oxygen. It's an aerobic process. So it uses oxygen in order to resynthesize the ATP. Now, these systems um, all have their sort of strengths and benefits or their sort of inherent limitations. So we can kind of categorize these in two ways. We can think about the sort of maximum rate of ATP resynthesis. So kind of the power, how fast it is. And then we can look at the total amount or the capacity of the system. So not really worrying about how fast it um, occurs, but how much in total ATP can that sort of system resynthesize. And so you might want to think of it like... Um, a car, different types of car. So um, you can have cars, if you think about it, that can be incredibly fast, but they may not be able to travel a large total distance. So that would be an example of a car with a, maxim, with a high maximum rate or power, but a low total amount. And conversely, you could have a car like, say, you know, a hybrid or an electric car or something like that, which has very low power, so it doesn't create energy very fast, but it can create energy over a long period of time. So its capacity can be really high. It can travel a long distance. And this is kind of what happens with these, these three systems of ATP resynthesis. So this immediate energy system, this ATP PCR system, it has a high rate of energy production. So you can see it can produce 36 kcals of energy per minute. 
case it's high power but unfortunately it has a low capacity so this is your hybrid so this is your um, your supercar so it's really fast it can resynthesize the ATP really quickly but it can't resynthesize that much ATP before it runs out on the other side of the spectrum we have the oxidative uh, phosphorylation system so in this system what we can see is the maximum power so the rate of ATP resynthesis is a lot lower so it's only able to resynthesize you know 10 kcals of energy per minute but essentially it kind of has unlimited um, capacity so you can think about this as, as your sort of hybrid car it's not very fast but it's going to keep going for a long time and then in the middle, we have this intermediate system, if you like, which is anaerobic glycolysis, which has an intermediate sort of power, if you like, and an intermediate capacity. Now, this is all really important because what these, through interacting with one another, what this allows us to do, um, or allows the system to do, is meet the different demands that we place on our body all the time. So sometimes we want to be fast like a supercar, and other times we want to be slow um, like uh, like a hybrid car. Right, and so another way to think about um, how these systems work with one another it's quite difficult to explain what I'm going to try my best. It's by thinking of sort of um, these systems um, like water. So this is a model, it's called the Mar Mar Margarita's Hydraulic Bioenergetic, Bioenergetic Model. So it's kind of suggesting that we can think about these things by thinking about like how water is used to, um, to produce energy. So if we think about it in the, from the sort of simplest level, so the ATP PCR system, so I suggested to you that the ATP PCR system has um, a high um, power, if you like. So if we think about this from a water point of view, you can kind of maybe imagine that it's like a, a sort of fireman's hose, if you, um, if you think about that, would allow a lot of water to come out of it. So it's got high power. But again, unfortunately for the ATP PCR system, um, it's got a low capacity so we can kind of imagine it's you know the, the amount of water that's in the system that's going to come out of this holes, hose might only be equivalent to say like a sink for an example so it's a daft example but just try and make a point right and if we look at the other end of the spectrum well oxidative phosphorylation we said well it's got low power so you can imagine only a, a small amount of water is going to be able to flow through a straw. So it's not going to be able to kind of um, add to the system very quickly, but its capacity is huge. So we can maybe imagine it's uh, like the size of a swimming pool. And so if you think about it, if you were to let water drip through a straw from a swimming pool um, as fast as it would like, it could possibly go through that straw. The swimming pool is going to last a long time. So all the water within it. And then, um, and then glycolysis is the intermediate again. And so glycolysis might be, well, actually, the capacity might be represented by sort of a, a garden hose, so an in intermediate of the two. You know, you can, uh, a garden hose will allow a reasonable amount of water to come through it, not as much as a fireman's hose, but more than a straw. And similarly, its capacity is intermediate as well. So, you know, it's not as small as a, a, a basin, um, but it's larger than its... Sorry, it's not as small as a basin, yeah, but it's smaller than a swimming pool. And the way you can think about it is that these systems interact with one another. So if we're using energy at a really high rate, you know, we're going to require the, the, the water, if you like, that would come from the fireman's hose. And so what would happen is this ATP PCR sort of system would start to deplete because the water would be coming out too fast. So even though we're trying to resynthesize it, the water would be coming out really fast. Now we can try and supplement that if we're doing really high intensity exercise, so equivalent of needing a lot of water, by turning on our glycolysis system, our anaerobic glycolysis, because 
that then would feed into this system here and mean that your ATP PCR um, stores would de uh, would deplete a lot a lot more slowly. And similarly, you could turn on your oxidative phosphorylation system, and that would also contribute. But you can imagine that its contribution would be quite small because its power is quite low. Now, if we think about a different sort of scenario, if we think about maybe an endurance race, well, in an endurance race, you know, we we don't need to turn this sort of Feynman's hose on very um, very high, so we wouldn't need to have a high requirement to use our ATP PCR system or potentially even our glycolysis. Maybe in that scenario, we could use our oxidative phosphorylation system because we know it has a really high capacity and that can kind of feed into the system and be able to maintain our ATP PCR stores quite high. And so that's the sort of the, what's going on all the time. Every time you start to do exercise, your kind of body is adjusting to the demands of the exercise. You know, is it short and intense? Is it long and prolonged? And it's kind of using these systems to allow it to be able to do the exercise in the best way possible. And you could also think about it, you know, um, from another perspective, which might be simpler, and that is just, you know, if you're doing a particular type of exercise at the highest intensity over a particular duration. So, for example, if you ran for as, you know, as hard as you could for two hours, you know, the overall um, amount of or the overall rate required to perform that exercise is going to be quite low because your intensity over a two hour run is going to be a lot lower than your intensity, say, over a two second run. So if you're going to do your fastest two hour run, um, because the power is low and, but, and it has a long duration, you know, you can see this sort of blue line here, which indicates that the majority of the energy requirements for that run are going to be met through the aerobic system. Whereas, you know, if you're doing an exercise at highest intensity for one second or half a second, well, in that system, you're going to be largely, um, well, first off, the pink line here indicates that you're going to need to use a lot more energy and you're going to meet those demands largely through your ATP stores. So not even the ATP PCR system, the stores are going to need to be there because you're going to need so much ATP so quickly. If you look at a sort of more intermediate point, like say, you know, two minutes, at two minutes or just under, um, there's a high requirement of anaerobic glycolysis, which is labelled here as the lactate system, and, but also a significant requirement from the aerobic system. So at this kind of level, you know, sort of like a maybe 400 metres, 800 metres sort of distance, what it's sort of indicating is that you're going to have a requirement on your aerobic system, but also your anaerobic glycolysis system. And I suppose the reason I want to put this on here is because even though from a sport perspective, we do lots of activities that are, say, two minutes and below and have a high requirement for, say, ATP stores, ATP PCR system um, and aerobic glycolysis. As, um, most people and most activities that people do tend to be above two minutes. So for most individuals, say, whether it be someone who's elderly or someone in a particular disease state, or even just a lot of um, healthy younger people, you know, they will tend to do longer runs or they will tend to go for hikes or, um, you know, cycle to work and back, whatever it might be. So often the majority of exercise that people do, they tend to have a high requirement um, on their aerobic system. So it's a really important system um, from, a, from a health perspective. Um, and there's, so obviously I've kind of made a, a case for why aerobic exercise might be important, but um, and not to say that you know anaerobic exercise and anaerobic training and all these things are important in context as well. Um, but just another reason why sort of um, there's a high requirement or the aerobic system is often preferred and worthwhile can sort of considering and understanding more is that, as many of you will know, the sort of anaerobic system is kind of an expensive and sort of limited system. So we've already seen that you know the ATP PCR anaerobic glycolysis systems have low capacity, so they can't resynthesize that much ATP in total. But they're also, from a sort of um, substrate perspective, quite expensive. So, you know, if you were to use two, um, two molecules of ATP, um, sorry, two molecules of ATP would be required um, per, per molecule of glucose. Sorry, I've explained that terribly there. Um, So the 
if we think about it from um, a substrate perspective, um, what we can also see is that uh, anaerobic metabolism is also kind of an expensive mechanism um, from that perspective as well. So if we look at anaerobic metabolism for a molecule of glucose, you're able to resynthesize one, uh, sorry, two molecules of ATP. Whereas for the same molecule of glucose, which has been resynthesized through aerobic respiration, we're able to resynthesize um, 36 to 38 ATP. So what you can see for, you know, you know, the we have a requirement to sort of um, deliver and utilize glucose as well. And if we're using that through an aerobic mechanism, it's much more efficient than using it through an, an, an anaerobic mechanism. So this is kind of another reason why, you know, aerobic respiration is kind of um, kind of preferential, um, a preferential system that's used within the body. Okay, so all of this, what I've said so far, is largely just to try and make sure that you're happy with and you accept that aerobic metabolism is an incredibly important system. It is the most efficient with regards to substrate utilization. And it has almost limited capacity and it's much more uh, readily used for most of the activities that people do. So oxygen is important. And so it's probably worthwhile knowing how much we use or how much the individual can use and how we can use it. And lucky for us, this is what we do. It's one of the sort of cornerstones of exercise physiology is measuring oxygen consumption or oxygen uptake. Now, oxygen uptake is usually measured um, from the air that we breathe in and out. And, you know, this can be complicated. Um, and it, can, you know, it is complicated at some level, but it's also incredibly simple at another level. So all we're doing when we're measuring oxygen uptake is thinking about um, how much, so I'll, well, I'll take you through the calculation, so VO2, so first off, VO2 stands for the volume, V, of oxygen, O2, and the little dot at the top per unit of time, so per minute, so the volume of oxygen used or utilised per minute, and so the simple calculation for that is V dot I, so the volume of, of air inspired Per minute times the fraction of inspired oxygen, so how much oxygen is in that inspired air, minus the volume of expired air per minute times the fraction of expired oxygen in that air. So it can kind of sound complicated. And we measure it in lots of different units, litres per minute, mils per minute, or mils per kilogram. But even though it seems complicated, it's actually incredibly simple as well. I'm going to go on to the next slide. But all this is really saying is the amount of oxygen that we use is equal to the amount of oxygen that we breathe in minus the amount of oxygen that we breathe back out. So how much do we breathe in minus how much we breathe out equals how much we've used. Um, and this is the really part. So the important concept in this slide is this, and I can't. I can't get this across um, enough, and I will mention it lots of times in lectures and seminars and things, is when often when students think about oxygen consumption, they think about the lungs. Because we're measuring it in the expired air, it tricks them into thinking that what we're measuring is something to do with breathing and ventilation and stuff like that, and it's not. You know, we've just spent the last 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes, talking about how the um, oxygen is utilized in the cells in order to resynthesize ATP for energy production. So when we're measuring oxygen consumption in the air, we're really using it um, to allow us to understand what's happening in the muscle and in the tissue. So the important concept is pulmonary gas exchange, which is what we're doing, what we measure, accurately reflects mean muscle tissue gas exchange. So what we're measuring in the lung accurately reflects what's happening in the muscle. And that's why we measure it. So when we see VO2, think muscle and oxygen consumption of the muscle. Don't think the lungs. Okay. So then this is an also a simpler way of sort of reiterating the same point. So think about this example. Let's say we are, someone's doing some exercise and we're measuring their oxygen. They may inspire four litres of oxygen, okay? 
and then they breathe back out three litres of oxygen. So if they breathed in four litres of oxygen and breathed back out three litres of oxygen, that means we have one litre of oxygen kind of unaccounted for. Now, we have really low stores of oxygen in the body and it tends to be quite consistent. So what this means is if this litre of oxygen that's gone missing must have been utilised by the body, it must have gone somewhere. And hopefully some of you will know that what's happened to that oxygen is it's been turned into carbon dioxide. And so you're breathing back out more carbon dioxide because that's what's been converted into. So that's a simple calculation. So when we think about oxygen uptake, firstly, we're thinking about the muscle. And secondly, we're thinking about this really simple calculation. How much do we breathe in? How much do we breathe back out? What's the difference between the two? Because that indicates how much we've used to resynthesize that ATP primarily in the muscle. Okay, so a few questions to sort of finish off with. And again, I do advise you to do this. So what I'd like to do is we're going to go through a series of, of again, sort of thought processes. So the first one is um, these, two, these two figures here. So what we've got here is we've got work rate in blue. So this is somebody who gets onto an exercise bike and then does three minutes of sitting at rest and then starts to cycle at, let's say, 100 watts. And that's what this blue bar represents. And so what I'd like you to do is think about what you think happens to, happens to ATP hydrolysis. So the breakdown of ATP um, when somebody is performing this bout. So what happens at rest? So what happens between minute zero and minute three? What happens when somebody starts to do this work here? And then what happens when they continue to do the same amount of work for a long period of time? So for ATP breakdown. And then I'd like you to do the same here. Um, in this different type of protocol. So in this protocol, they've done six minutes of rest and then they've started this incremental exercise bout. So this is where the amount of work that they're asked to do on the bike increases a little bit each second until you get to a higher intensity. So I have two minutes and just draw. You can draw it with your finger on the screen. You can sort of jot it down on paper, whatever you like, but do commit to it. What happens to ATP breakdown hydrolysis at rest and then what happens when they when somebody starts to exercise in these two different um, types of work? Okay, so if you pause the video for two minutes now. All right, okay. So the answers that I often get for this. Uh, well, some people will start off with ATP hydrolysis being zero, but obviously that's not going to be true, is it? Because you always need to produce, liberate energy, even when you're sat at rest. So your body's still working, you're not dead. So you have a baseline level of ATP resynthesis. And then most people are usually pretty happy that if you're staying in the same metabolic state, so let's say rest, that you're going to need a steady amount of ATP um, a breakdown so it's going to stay fairly stable and then when it hits this block of work so when someone's asked to do some exercise um, the responses are different so some people think that there'll be a smooth increase like this up to a certain point and then maybe it'll stabilize some people talk about like a curved response something like that sometimes people think it'll go directly up and then straighten off um, and then sometimes people think it does all sorts of stuff, like sometimes there's a curve this way, and then they think it'll stabilise, and then it'll start to drift up over time. Um, and then, so, and that's really the answer. So the answer is that it's stable at rest, so we need some, but if we don't, if we don't increase um, our energy requirements, then we're not going to increase our ATP breakdown. But then we start this block of work, when we start the block of work, this is kind of a, a sort of theoretical, really, because you don't really measure ATP breakdown, but it goes directly up. It goes directly up, and then it goes directly across. So it matches the work that's being produced. And the point I'm trying to get across here is that if you think about this, if you need to do, let's say, 100 watts of work, there is going to be an amount of ATP breakdown required to liberate the energy to do that 100 watts and you're also going to need it immediately so if you're not if you're not breaking down 
ATP, you're not going to be able to do this work. It would be impossible. So if you had a slope that looked like this, then by definition, you would have to have an exercise pro profile that looked the same because the hydrolysis is dictating the amount of energy that you're able to do. So it has to match it. And similarly, if you're staying at the same intensity of work, by and large, you're going to have to have exactly the same amount of ATP hydrolysis. So it would make no sense for it to keep going up because the body is actually producing the same amount of work. So there could be some subtle changes to this if you really get into the depths of it. But from our perspective, that's how I'd like you to think about it. If you want to do some work, you have to break down ATP at an appropriate level to source the energy to be able to do that work. And this is exactly the same for this different protocol. So we have a resting level that stays the same. And then as we do this different profile, where it's this incremental protocol, well now, you know, we don't require as much energy heat at minute eight as we require at minute 12. And so at minute eight, our ATP hydrolysis is lower than it is at minute 12. And so the hydrolysis reflects the amount of work that's being produced. So the point I want to get across here is that in order to perform a given amount of work, a relative amount of ATP hydrolysis is required to provide the energy to do that work. Now the next question, very simple, is what about ATP resynthesis? So we've just talked about breakdown, but what we've said is that you also need to resynthesize that ATP in order for it to be there, to be hydrolysized to do, to do work. So same question, what will happen to ATP resynthesis? So the building back up of, re of ATP for these two protocols. So if you can pause your video for two minutes now. All right, so the answers are largely the same. And so if you think about it like this, if you're going to use ATP um, um, at, so if you're going to do some work, like this person on the bike, and that means that you need a certain amount of ATP hydrolysis to do that work. Well, you're also going to need a very, very similar amount of ATP resynthesis. And the reason you're going to need that same amount is because the, our ATP stores are really low. So if you're breaking down ATP at a certain rate, you need to be resynthesizing it at a certain rate in order to be able to maintain the exercise intensity. If you weren't, then by definition, we would have to reduce the intensity of exercise to accommodate the reduction in ATP that's available to do the exercise. So ATP resynthesis really has to match ATP breakdown. There's a slight subtle difference, and I've tried to reflect that kind of in a slight curve here, and that is we do have very small amounts of ATP stores which would be used in that initial part of exercise in order to allow us to start exercising immediately before we were able to start that resynthesis process. But by and large, it's the same. And so the kind of the message for this slide is we have low ATP stores and therefore ATP resynthesis needs to match hydrolysis in order to perform sustained exercise. Right, last one. So now we get back to oxygen consumption. So what I'd like you to do is draw the oxygen uptake response for these two protocols. So if you pause the video for two minutes now. Okay, so what do we get for this? Well, this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. So some people will kind of go through the process and they'll be following it and I kind of like this answer where they'll say, well, it's going to be the same again because we need to resynthesize. If we're going to break down ATP at a certain rate and we need to resynthesize ATP at a certain rate and we know that oxygen is used for ATP resynthesis, then we're going to have to have the same pattern of oxygen consumption. OK, um, some people kind of lose the plot a little bit and they start doing sort of like curves up this way and they start having things going all over the place. Um, but this is this is kind of these are the answers. So we're going to focus on this one here, really. So what happens during exercise is we get this kind of curved response. And some people get this. Some people know this, either remember it or they figure it out. So what happens is, you know, our oxygen consumption at rest is stable. So our metabolic rate is remaining stable 
our ATP resynthesis is stable, our um, hydrolysis is stable, and so our oxygen consumption is stable. But then we give the body this insult, like now you need to hydrolyze more ATP. So now you need to resynthesize ATP. So now ideally you need to utilize more oxygen. But the body's not able to kind of cope with that demand in terms of its oxygen consumption. And it has this curved response before eventually, you know, getting to a rate which is able to largely resynthesize all of that ATP through aerobic mechanisms, and then it remains stable for the duration of the exercise. This is all under the presumption of moderate intensity exercise. But we have this curve at the start, and so the questions are, well, why do we have this curve? Why are we not able to increase our oxygen consumption to meet our ATP resynthesis demands? And the answer is that this process of, of um, aerobic metabolism is a quite a complex one which uses dozens and dozens of enzymes that all need to be turned on and coordinated and upregulated in order to be able to resynthesize that ATP. So it's not able to turn on quickly enough and get to its sort of operational levels as quick as we would like. And what you find is in people that are really fit, because they probably have more of the enzymes, the enzymes might be more functional, they're able to get there a little bit quicker. So they have a shallower curve, or steeper curve, sorry. And you have people who are really unfit, they have a shallower curve. It goes like that, they take longer to get to their steady state. And there can be several reasons for this, but one of the reasons can be for the opposite of what I've just said about the elite athlete. You know, their system is not as well refined, so maybe they have less aerobic enzymes. Maybe they can't upregulate them as quickly. Maybe they, um, so it takes a little bit longer for them to turn on and work, and therefore it takes them longer to get to their steady state. So then the next question is if we're happy with that, and it can also be other things it can be, you know, if you're not able to deliver oxygen to the muscles because your heart isn't working properly, that can cause a lag, things like that. Um, so the next question is, well, how are we able to do this 100 watts of exercise? Because we're still doing the work here. We're still producing 100 watts of exercise before our aerobic system is adequately resynthesizing the ATP. So the question is, how can we do it? If we're now not resynthesizing this ATP entirely through aerobic mechanisms, how are we able to do the exercise? So I'd encourage you to just have a 30 seconds to think about it so you can come up with a good justification. Now, when I ask this in class, usually a few people get it. And the answer is, well, this is where we rely on our non-aerobic mechanisms, so our anaerobic mechanisms. So the only reason we can do this 100 watts of exercise before we have you know, an adequate amount of oxygen consumption is because we're turning on our ATPPR systems and our anaerobic glycolysis. And in combination with the aerobic systems, they're not allowing us to be able to, um, to produce this work um, early on in the exercise. So it's a combination of ATPPCR resynthesis, maybe even a little bit of ATP stores, anaerobic glycolysis and aerobic respiration and then bit by bit as it goes on and on and on the glycolysis sort of reduces a little bit the ATP PCR system reduces a bit and we become more and more reliant on our aerobic um, respiration so if you think about it you know if we're doing exercise and you know what we know here is that again as soon as we get past a couple of minutes of exercise we're primarily reliant on our ATP resynthesis through oxygen uh, aerobic mechanisms, so through aerobic respiration. Um, you know, again, it's, it gives an indication of why it's so important to have a highly functional um, aerobic metabolism. And what's beautiful from our point of view is that this is one of the primary things that we measure day to day. So we're always measuring oxygen consumption. So, um, so this is this is great that this is something that's really important for sort of health and fitness and things like that. And it's something that we learn to measure from sort of day one in, in our undergraduate course. And just a sort of final point, these, the relationship between these things are um, fairly fixed. So one day you don't come here and like need to do 100 watts and all of a sudden your oxygen uptake is up there. And then the next day your oxygen uptake is down here. Your oxygen uptake is, has a certain relationship to the ATP resynthesis and to the amount of work that you're doing. And so this only works for sort of moderate intensity exercise, but it's really important to kind of have as a ballpark figure in your head is that for every 10 watts of exercise you want to do, let's say on a bike, 
it requires about an extra 100 mils of oxygen uptake. So if we wanted to do an extra 100 watts of work, the increase in our oxygen uptake would be in and around one litre. So 10 times 100 mils. Now, if we wanted to do 200 watts of work, then our oxygen uptake would increase by about two litres. So this relationship is, is largely fairly fixed at moderate intensity exercise, and it's worthwhile having in your head. OK, so last slide. Um, so this is basically the lecture in a nutshell. All I've tried to get across to you today is this simple idea, is that oxygen uptake increases linear with exercise intensity. So if we increase the amount of work that we do, let's say on a bike, that is going to require us to hydrolyze and resynthesize more ATP. So it's going to increase ATP turnover. And that increase in ATP turnover is going to require an increase in oxygen consumption. And the relationships between these things is by and large fairly fixed. It's not always fixed, it's not fixed in all scenarios, there's some variability in it, but for our purposes, we can kind of think about these as having kind of a fixed relationship. If we want to increase the work we perform by a leap by 100 watts, it will require a certain amount extra of ATP turnover, which will require an increase in, let's say, a litre of oxygen consumption. So, in order to sustain high levels of continuous work like you would do on a run or a hike or something like that, it means we need to be able to deliver and utilise higher levels of oxygen consumption. Right, OK, so just in summary, ATP, uh, work ATP resynthesis and oxygen uptake increase during exercise in this coordinated fashion. They're related to one another. It's not different each time that you do exercise. It's an absolute fundamental aspect of applied physiology. You'll need it in all of your modules to some extent. And it underpins a lot of what we're going to do in our module. If you want to do some further reading and get an ex any exercise physiology textbook and just read the, the chapter on oxygen consumption, um, be that the kind of from a physiological perspective or a um, sort of how, how to measure it and understand like the measurements that we take when we're measuring oxygen consumption. Um, and then you could also go away and think start thinking about how it relates to health, because I imagine thus far, you, when you hear terms like VO2 max or oxygen uptake, you just think about it from a performance perspective, when actually it probably has more, um, it, it probably has greater uh, application to, to health than it does performance. Um, as in previous weeks, if you have any questions, then post them on the now discussions section, and I'll do my best to answer them.